Uh, okay, so I'll give a quick another reintroduction for the people who joined. Uh, my name is PJ, I'm Girls of Steel software mentor. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about um, how the software team thinks about things. Um, this is primarily for cross training, um, just to get an idea of what we do um, and how we can work with the mechanical and design sub teams to make everybody's lives easier. Um, and some of the pain points that we go through and just general knowledge about um, how we write software. Um, so, uh, just said half of this, um, I'm not going to show any code tonight, uh, cause this is supposed to be just a high level ideas about how we think, um, and not actually digging into code. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about, um, specifically Java, uh, FRC coding, um, we will be offering some workshops for the next two weeks. Um, and I don't think I'll be able to fit all of my stuff in there. So we'll probably actually add a couple more on later to that. Um, but tonight, high level stuff. Um, we're going to talk about, we sort of get a kit of parts. I put it in quotes because it's not the same thing that like you get in the blue bins from first. Um, discuss some of the tools we have, um, why it looks like we're doing nothing sometimes, uh, and why it looks like we're going crazy when we're tuning stuff. I'll get into what tuning means. Um, why it takes longer than we think it uh, will, and why we need even more time than that. Um, so jumping into like what our kit of parts is. Uh, so similarly to how the team gets a blue bin full of various components that will help us with the year, uh, First and uh, the other vendors provide us with some libraries that we can use um, as a base for uh, writing our software. Um, so uh, WPI, the college, um, provides this library that they wrote many years ago um, for Java and C++. Uh, there's a third option to use LabVIEW and like a third and a half option to use Python, but um, I don't like LabVIEW and Python's not officially supported. Uh, a lot of teams, the vast, vast majority of teams use Java, um, specifically because it's taught as the AP class, so students might be learning it in high school anyway. Uh, it's a little bit easier to learn than C++. Um, so if you come to our workshops, like I mentioned before, our programming workshops will be done in Java. But anyway, uh, this gives us ways to interact with the RoboRio and our sensors and our motor controllers um, and all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of fancy stuff going on the hood, setting up interrupts and PWM timing and blah, 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 all that stuff you don't really need to know about because they gave us a library on top of it. Um, so giving it like a mechanical analogy, you can think of that like they give us some gears and pulleys and nuts and bolts, right? Very low level things that you can use to build up a bigger system. Uh, part of WPI Lib is frameworks that they provide uh, us. So there's a couple different frameworks that you can use. Uh, the most common one and the one that we use on Girls of Steel is called the command-based framework. I'll give a little bit of an introduction into that on the next slide. Um, but there's also a timed one that doesn't have some of the fancy features that command base does. There's a bunch of different options. Um, and you can think of this sort of like a mechanical design pattern. Like you have a four bar, uh, maybe you have a vectored intake. It's an idea, but we have to craft our design around it. How big do we want the four bar to be? How far does it have to extend? Um, is our intake going over the bumpers? Those are kind of analogies to how we use the framework to um, design our stuff, cater to our robot. Um, now, separate from WPI Lib, but also given to us, is ways to communicate with the third-party vendors. Uh, so the ones that you're probably most familiar with are Cross the Road Electronics. They provide uh, the Falcons. Um, the Falcons is the brushless motor with the speed controller on it, I think. Uh, but also the Pigeon IMU um, and some other things. Uh, Rev Robotics. So they are the big competitor of CTRE that has the Spark Maxes. Um, as well as a bunch of different, now they do the control system uh, and a bunch of other stuff. And if you've ever used the Navex IMU, they also similarly provide a library so that we can talk to their uh, IMU. And they also provide us with a bunch of handy tools that make our debugging uh, a lot easier. And some of uh, things like path planning, if we're doing a fancy autonomous mode, they provide us with tools to make that a lot easier. Um, I'll say if at any point you have questions, just interrupt me. You don't need to do the hand raise thing. Just unmute yourself and ask a question uh, anytime that you want. Um, I'll also say there's going to be a couple of times that I ask for interaction. 
Uh, same thing, if I ask a question and you know the answer, uh, just unmute yourself and blurt it out. I'm not a teacher, I'm not used to that whole thing. Um, so about the command-based framework. Um, so the idea here is that we break the robot down into smaller components, much like we do when we do a mechanical design. Um, so the first thing that we think about is what are our subsystems? Now, likely on your team, you break your robot down into subsystems like chassis, intake, shooter, blah, blah, blah. We do the same thing on the software team. Um, typically, there's a one-to-one -one ratio between what you mechanical guys say is a subsystem and what we say is a subsystem. There are a couple of slight caveats, like um, the past two years on Girls of Steel, uh, the mechanical people called one thing um, the intake or conveyor system. And due to some of the uh, idiosyncrasies of the framework, we said, well, we're going to call it a horizontal conveyor and a vertical conveyor. So we broke it down into two things where the mechanical uh, kids thought of it as one thing. But overall, there's sort of a one-to-one -one matching. Um, and you can kind of think of this like a noun, like chassis is a noun. Um, and then on top of that, we build what we call commands. And you can think of those as like a verb. So like, I have my chassis and I want to make it drive and tell you I want to read joysticks and make it move. Uh, I want to be able to spit a ball out, um, suck a ball in, shoot at an RPM, raise an elevator up, uh, anything like that. Those are all commands. Um, and the really cool thing about commands is that you can combine them together to create more complicated uh, commands. So you can combine things in parallel or in sequence. So uh, the best example of that is when we create autonomous modes. Um, Right, so you do step one, step two, step three, you can bundle that all into what we call a sequential command. And then it's just super easy to interact with. You can throw that up on your dashboard, which we'll talk about later, and have that be your autonomous mode, just running a bunch of the bite-sized commands that you've made previously. Um, so the super nice thing about the command-based framework, it allows us a ton of code reuse because we can make something for Teleop and then easily reuse it in autonomous. Um, so I have a couple of examples of that. Uh, please appreciate my terrible, terrible drawing. Um, we do these things called code labs and I made a, st a stupid, simple little robot visualization for our, our code lab, um, teaching the kids how to make some of these things for our dashboard. So it's ugly, but it gets the point across here. Um, so imagine that you had some sub subsystem that had a pneumatic. A lot of teams this year had vectored intakes, maybe on a four bar linkage, whatever but which are powered by pneumatics. So pneumatic is my favorite thing to use because they're so dirt simple. Uh, you just have a pneumatic subsystem. We can call it a punch subsystem in this case. That's what this example is using. Um, and basically it just has two commands. You can extend your solenoid and you can retract your solenoid. Um, and another nice thing about these commands is you can easily hook them up to a button on the joystick. So we can say when the X button on our Xbox controller is hit, we will extend it. And then when the operator lets go of that button, we can run the retract command. So nice and simple. <clears throat> uh, another example, uh, maybe we have an elevator. Maybe it's a year like 20, 2007, 2011, 2019, where we have to, it's a pick and place game and we have to raise things up. Uh, so that elevator has a motor connected to it uh, and an encoder. Talk about sensors later. Uh, maybe multiple motors, blah, blah, blah. On programming, we think of it as one motor that we're really talking to. So it's got a motor and encoder. It can go up and down. Um, and maybe there's preset scoring heights. Uh, so three places that we want to go to. We want the driver or operator to have a button. When I hit this, go to this height so we can score our game piece. Um, so we can think about that as like two commands, maybe. I always like to have a manual override in case things are going funky so that we can manually adjust it. Um, so maybe we have one command that we can manually adjust things with one of the thumb joysticks on the Xbox controller. And then maybe we have another command that can go to some height. Uh, now, whoever is making my command can tell me how high to go. So I could use the same command three different times. If one time I provide it 10 inches, another time 25, another time 60 inches. Um, so that's another way that we can easily reuse code with the command-based system. Um, and then wiring it up, 
uh, we can say, if they're not pressing one of our three magic buttons, we'll just do whatever the, the thumb says, whatever that joystick says. Otherwise, they can press the A button to go to the low rung, X to middle, Y to high. Easy to wire this up. <clears throat> um, and finally, now comes my favorite part of stuff, when we wire up autonomous modes. So think about the two subsystems and the two commands that we just made. We can wire those together along with a chassis command that I didn't mention and create a relatively complicated autonomous mode. So we're gonna be talking to several subsystems, but so here's our autonomous mode. We wanna drive forward off some auto line. And while we're driving, we want to raise our elevator up. Like I said before, we can run these things in parallel, save ourselves a couple of seconds during our autonomous mode. Uh, once we're up there, maybe it's a game, the cube game where we can shoot a cube out, right? We'll extend it and then we'll bring our solenoid back in, those commands I mentioned before. And while we bring it in, we can lower our elevator back to the ground. Now I'm gonna drive forward to another cube. Let's say it's 2019. Pick it up, run through sort of the similar process, repeat and go score our thing. <clears throat> so all of these mini commands that we might've had mapped to buttons in teleop mode, we can reuse all those commands here. Uh, and our wiring, we'll call this autonomous mode zero. Um, our favorite one, the one that we want to run every match, and that's our autonomous mode command. Um, so to do all these fancy things, uh, it helps a lot if we have sensors to do it. Um, if you are trying to do stuff without sensors, you're driving completely blind, you got to hope for the best. It's very hard to do things autonomously if you don't have some way of knowing where you are or how fast you're going. Um, so some of the basic ones. Uh, the very first one, the most common one that we use on a robot, uh, especially since we're now in the brushless revolution and all the motors have built-in encoders, uh, is an encoder. So an encoder is something that measures rotations of a shaft. Um, it does this cool thing where it's got black and white lenses inside and it counts how many transitions there are. Uh, but at the end of the day, it says, I've turned one time around. I've turned two times around. Now, depending on our um, application, if it's on our chassis, we can say, well, I know I have six inch wheels. So if the wheel turns one time, that means I've gone six pi inches forward, right? Um, now, a tricky thing about encoders is your traditional encoder measures relative uh, rotations. So what that means is when you power the robot on, it starts at zero. Uh, that can be super annoying for some things. If you have an elevator and you turn it on and it's halfway up, it's gonna think it's at the bottom, right? So sometimes when we use encoders, if it's a situation like an elevator, uh, you might wanna have some zeroing mechanism, like a limit switch down below. When you hit the limit switch, zero out the encoder. Um, nowadays, there's also uh, absolute encoders, which can remember what their zero is across power cycle. So if any of you guys are using uh, the Swerve modules, they have some absolute encoder so that you don't have to like make sure you delicately place your robot with all four wheels pointed forward. Um, it's going to remember what the zero is across reboots, and you don't have to worry about that. Uh, a quick little caveat about that. Uh, all the ones that I've seen have lower resolution when you put them into absolute mode. Probably doesn't affect you, but just something that you might want to be aware of. Um, another super common thing that we use are what I bundled into one group called digital sensors. Um, so digital means true or false. Um, common ones that we use are a limit switch. Like I mentioned before, it's just, it's either, the limit switch is either pressed or not. And we might take some action on that. Like if it's pressed, we don't want to drive our motor down into it anymore because we might start stripping gears or causing other sorts of havoc. Um, this year, a lot of teams use beam brake sensors uh, where basically there's many types of them. Some do a reflect check for a reflection. Some of them are proximity sensors. Uh, at the end of the day, you're using it to be like, there's something in front of me. I want to stop my intake when I see that there's a ball in this spot. Um, if any of you guys came from a VAX or an FTC thing, uh, 
you probably might've had a button on your robot to let you know if you hit a wall and that's maybe when you turn. That's something that's not very practical in FRC games, but that's a easy analogy to make to real life, right? Or a light switch, your light switch is on or off, right? Um, another one that with the abundance of relative absolute encoders is a little bit less necessary now is a sensor called the potentiometer. So similar to an encoder, it measures rotations, um, but due to the nature by which it works, it remembers it's zero across power cycles. So it sort of has the same idea as a relative encoder. Uh, you might be able to get more resolution out of one if you care about tiny, tiny changes. Um, but the, the downside of a potentiometer is that it has a limited range. So typically they get sold that they can only in, in uh, configurations where they can only turn like three quarters of a turn. Um, some of them are 10 turns. So this isn't something that you would necessarily want on a swerve drive module, because if you go too far around, you'll snap your potentiometer in half and it won't work anymore. Um, but it could, like a turret could be a good application, right? You have a limited range of motion on your turret. Maybe you could use a potentiometer instead of an absolute encoder so that you don't have to worry about zeroing it. Um, now, two other important sensors, I crossed them out because the IMU is a combination of them, but a gyroscope is something that we can use to measure angle. Um, technically, it measures rate of change of angle, but our libraries that get provided to us uh, turn that rate of change into an actual angle. So that's super handy to put on your drivetrain, right? If you want to turn 90 degrees to shoot to a target, uh, you need a sensor that can measure that 90 degrees, right? So that's what a gyroscope does. Um, an accelerometer is a sensor that you might have guessed measures acceleration. Um, <clears throat> so in practice, this probably doesn't get used that much in FRC robots. Uh, I know in the 2012 year when they had the balance thing that you had to go on, some teams used the accelerometer to be like, hey, I'm tilted. I need to balance the bridge a little bit better. Um, you could also use it if you wanted to know if you ran into anything, right? You'd have a sudden deceleration if you hit a wall. Uh, but uh, the reason they're crossed out, like I said, is there's another cool sensor called an IMU, which has three axes of gyroscope, um, yaw, side to side, pitch, up and down, and roll, side to side. Um, and also a accelerometer for X, Y, X, Y, and Z. Um, and through a bunch of complicated math that we don't need to go into, when all of those work together, you actually get a better result out of a gyroscope. Um, because it's measuring rate, it can get a little bit drifty over time. So just having all of these things work together, fusing all this data together, uh, results in a gyroscope that drifts a little bit less. Um, so if you have the money to buy a Pigeon uh, from CTRE or a Navex from Kawhi Labs, uh, I recommend it. It's a one-time purchase that you can use year over year. Uh, just slap that IMU on and you can get very good um, angular measurements for a drivetrain. Um, and the last thing I have listed here is vision, specifically the limelight. Uh, none of you kids are probably around in the pre-limelight days, but it's absolutely a cheat code. It's amazing. Uh, it can find retroreflective targets super easy and give you very consumable numbers uh, back so you can figure out where a target is relative to your robot. Um, there are many other vision solutions that you can do. Um, some teams went crazy and had their own cameras running machine learning for ball detection and stuff like that. But uh, I recommend buying a limelight. This is a much heavier purchase. Uh, these are $500, I think, and they're very hard to get because nobody can buy Raspberry Pis. Um, but if you can work that into your budget and next year is a game that has retroreflective targets, highly recommend getting a lot of it. <clears throat> um, and there's many other sensors, but these are the common ones that you would want to think about when you're doing uh, a mechanical design about how can I measure what my robot is doing. So now I'm going to jump into my favorite part of stuff, control system things. So, uh, you know, this year we had to shoot balls. 
So you get a lot more repeatable results if you can say, I'm going to shoot this ball at 1100 RPM. Every time I shoot, it's going to be 1100 RPM, as opposed to saying like, I'll just throw seven volts at it and hope that that gets me to 1100. Uh, you really want a control system to, to do that. Same thing with driving, or if you had an elevator that you wanted to go to a height, you can't count on what's called dead reckoning, um, where you're just doing something for a certain amount of time or uh, something like that. Um, so it uses all those sensors that we listed before. Um, and there's many, many different types of control systems. I'm going to outline um, three of the common ones that we use. Uh, there's fancier ones like state space and blah, blah, blah. But I'll just go down the traditional ones. Um, and if you're wondering what this picture is, this is the cheesy poofs in the stronghold year, whatever that is. So in some ways, it's not as impressive as their shoot on the move or orbit shoot on the move this year. But this was like six years ago. The cheesy poofs are always just light years ahead. So they keep that turret right on the target, no matter how their robot's spinning. That's one of my favorite, favorite gifts. Um, anyway, so there's some things that we can do with timers and dead reckoning, and it's okay. Uh, I always recommend that we have an autonomous mode that gets us off the line with timers and dead reckoning. Just in case all of our encoders broke, something went terribly, terribly wrong in the match before, we have a simple one that's easy to run and can get us those five points or whatever it happens to be that year. Um, we can also use timers for if we have a big time budget, we, we aren't trying to squeeze down, shave down tenths of a second. Um, for instance, with our multi-ball autonomous mode, we ran our conveyors for three seconds, always. We didn't look at our, um, <laughs> we didn't look at our, uh, we had beam break sensors. We didn't use the beam break sensors. We just said, I know we'll shoot the second ball if we run it for three seconds. So there's many opportunities uh, where this is perfectly acceptable to do, but you could end up in a situation like you see in the image on the right, where who knows if they are doing a timer thing or if a sensor went haywire, but if you do it too long, you might run into a wall. Um, this is a crazy, probably a week zero, it looks like, where the robot just completely runs off the field because they weren't checking encoders or something went wrong with their encoders. Um, so the most common control system that we do is called PID. Um, in some situations, PIDF. Um, and the I and the D turns have some relevance to calculus, but you don't need to know calculus to get one of these things tuned up. Uh, the general idea is that you have some goal and you have your current location, and there's an error between that, right? Like if I wanna to go to five feet and I'm at zero feet, I have an error of five. Uh, and using this error value, we can tweak some parameters and uh, figure out some speed or some voltage that we wanna to send to our motors. Um, so to go over the terms quickly, uh, P is short for proportional. And the general idea there is as I get closer to something, I'm gonna go slower, which sort of makes sense, right? If we're an inch away, we don't wanna be going full speed. Um, but if we're all the way across the field, maybe we do wanna be going full speed or maybe we have a cap on it or whatever. But the general idea is as I get closer, I'll slow down. Um, I put them out of order here because D is second, typically the second parameter that we would tune. And the idea there is, Maybe you're coming in hot, like super hot. Oh, so I'll say what derivative means real quick for those who probably, all of you probably haven't taken any calculus. So D is called derivative, which um, means the slope of a line. And really what that means is the change in this measurement from the last measurement, uh, where our measurements are error. So if the last time I had an error of five, and this time I have an error of three, our difference between those would be our derivative. Our derivative would be two. Usually when I tell this to the software kids, I give a much better explanation, just quick, quick calculus. Uh, but the idea is, oh my God, my error is changing super fast. I'm coming in way too hot to this thing. I'm going to slam on the brakes. Um, so it's kind of like a braking factor. You can kind of think of it like that. 
Um, one analogy that I sometimes give is if I ask you all to stand up right now and touch your nose to a wall across the room as fast as possible, <laughs> uh, do it as fast as possible. You're probably going to implicitly do some PID thing where you start out sprinting and then you slow down when you get there and maybe you brace yourself with your hands, right? You come right up to the thing and brace yourself. That bracing yourself with your hands, slowing yourself down is kind of like the derivative term here. Um, and then integral, most stuff that we do, you don't need to actually tune this number at all. I, we always leave it at zero. But the idea there is to get rid of steady state error. So like maybe you're not quite getting to your line and it just adds a little bit extra um. So integral in calculus term <laughs> is area under curve, yes. So it's um, the sum of your error over time. So if I was off by one inch last time and I'm off by 0.9 this time, my integral value would be 1.9. And then I multiply that by my I term to get some power that I'm going to send to the motor. Um, I'm going to come back to F real quick, but here's the first interactive part. Shout out and answer if you know. So the very first question we want to ask uh, is once I get to my goal, do I want to stop or not? Uh, because there's two different paths that we go down based on that answer. So if I'm driving and I'm at, I start at zero and I want to go to five, what should I be doing? Should I be moving forward? Should I be moving backwards? Or should I be stopped? If I'm at zero and I want to be at five, what should I do in my next update? I said you guys can talk. <laughs> um, so one person said stop, one person said forward. Uh, apparently people don't want to talk. <laughs> but yeah, so if I'm at zero and I want to go to five, I need to drive towards five, right? Um, similarly, if I'm at 4.9, do I want to drive forward or do I want to stop? Or backwards, I'll throw backwards in there. 4.9 to five. Gotta say something. I'm okay with you typing it, I guess. Inch just a little bit closer, sure. Um, now, one last thing on this one. If I overshot it and now I'm at five, uh, now I'm at six feet, do I wanna go forward, backwards, or stop? Stop, I'm at six feet. I want a foot too far. I can't see myself. I don't know if my hands are on screen, but I want to go backwards there, right? But if I hit five right on the nose, then I want to stop. Uh, okay, so that's one type of thing. Now let's think about like, I have a flywheel, I'm shooting a ball. Um, so they hit the button, I'm at zero RPM and I want to go to a thousand RPM. Should I spin my motors or stop? At zero, I want to go to a thousand. I need to spin my motors, right? Okay, so now let's say that I hit my 1000. I'm at 1000. Do I wanna spin my motor or do I wanna stop my motor? Stop the motor. Well, if I stop the motor, it's gonna decelerate pretty fast, um, which is actually a different type of control called bang bang, where you just, you're either on or off. But if I'm at a thousand and I want to be at a thousand, I kind of want to just do whatever I'm doing, right? Um, I don't want to go any faster because then I'll be going, I'll make my RPM too high, miss my shot long. And I don't want to stop because then I'll decelerate and I'll miss my shot short. Um, yeah, if we have a flywheel, we want it to continue moving. Like we want to have it spin up and then wait for the ball to get in there. We want it just constantly at that 1000 RPM. Uh, so this comes into the F term that I skipped. Uh, the basic idea of the F term is that when I'm doing a velocity control system, my F term will get me very close to my goal without reading the sensor at all. So maybe I find out that like uh, one volt equals 250. RPM. So if I want to go a thousand, I can give it four volts. And 
if I'm perfect, I'll get there right away. If I'm on a dead battery, I might be a little bit slower and that's where I can add some P and D to get it where I want. Uh, if I got a brand new fresh battery off the line, 13.3 volts, maybe it's a little bit high and my P term can bring it down. Um, but that's the general idea. So to sum that up, if I'm doing a position control where I want to stop once I reach my goal, no F. If I'm doing a velocity controller where I want to continue moving when I'm at my goal, then we add F. Um, did that sort of make sense? I'm doing this control system stuff faster than I normally would do for my programming students. Um, so then we can also add some other offset in there uh, if we need to account for something. So typically PID uh, is meant to work with a linear system. Um, and the idea with that is like, if I put twice as many volts into the motor controller, I expect it to go twice as fast or something like this, some proportional linear ratio. Um, a motor curve isn't totally linear, uh, but it's close enough that we can easily use PID. Um, but sometimes we build mechanisms that are not linear. Maybe they do something different when you drive them one direction versus another, or maybe they behave differently uh, depending on how, without, I'm trying not to give a hint, how they're currently oriented. Um, does anybody have an idea of what could cause a nonlinearity in a system? There's one that's affecting all of us right now. It affects everything on earth all the time. Gravity? Yep, exactly. So uh, if I have an elevator, gravity's pulling that thing down, right? It's gonna go slower when I go up than when I go down. It's gonna shoot down super fast and take a lot of effort going up. Um, so in a mechanical, a mechanical way to fix this would be to add a counterweight or some counterbalancing system to it, right? If you think of an elevator that you have in a building, um, maybe you don't know this, but the, the carriage is heavy, right? That's gotta weigh a couple thousand pounds, just the carriage and the electronics and all that stuff. Uh, the motor down at the bottom would have to do a lot of work to move that heavy carriage up, especially if you got 10, 20 people in it, that's another thousand pounds on top of it. Really, really heavy. So what eleva elevator manufacturers do in buildings is they actually have a counterweight um, that weighs the same as the carriage itself. That way, when the elevator goes up, the weight goes down and vice versa. And that way, it kind of has the same behavior, whether it's going up or down, by adding this counterweight. Um, so we can add a similar sort of offset uh, to our PID system if we're working with a nonlinear thing. So an elevator is easy because gravity is affecting it the same uh, all the time, right? <clears throat> Assuming that it's perfectly vertical. Uh, so we can empirically uh, give our motor controller voltage and see when it starts to be able to hold itself up, when it's not getting pulled down by gravity anymore. So maybe we say, okay, it takes about a volt and a half to keep this thing steady. I'm gonna add a volt and a half to whatever my PID controller gives out. Uh, that way it can behave more or less the same when it goes up and when it goes down. Um, so gravity also affects arm-based systems. Can anybody think of why that is way more complicated? So if we call this 90 and this zero, I wish a kid answered that. I assume that's Tim. But yes, the arc changes it, uh, it changes throughout the arc, right? If I'm if we call this 90, this zero, if I'm at 88 degrees, it doesn't take a lot of extra energy to get to 90. But if I'm down at zero, it's got the full weight of gravity pulling on that moment arm. So it takes a lot more effort. So can anybody think of an equation that we can counter the effect of gravity based on the angle of the arm. I'll give you a hint, it's trig. And you probably all sat in class like, what do I need to know trig? Or you're all probably mechanical people. You probably use trig. But all the software kids are like, I'm never going to use trig. We use trig all the time. <laughs> 
So I have a big effort when I'm at zero degrees and a small effort, zero effort when I'm at one. Does anybody know what that trig function is? Is it something to do with like the law of cosines or something weird like that? Um, it's a little bit simpler uh, than that. Um, I'll just say it, it is cosine, right? When I'm at zero degrees, I want 100% I want one hundred percent gravity offset applied. And if I'm at zero at night, if I'm at 90 degrees, I want no gravity offset applied. Um, cause the cosine of zero is one and the cosine of 90 is zero. Uh, that all depends on how you define your coordinate system, right? If you want this to be zero and this 90, then you would use sine be the opposite. Um, but think about how much more complicated that makes it. Now we got to read the sensor. We got to hope that there's no delay in the sensor. Uh, we got to apply math to it. And you don't really get the gravity offset right to begin with. So there's just a lot more opportunities for noise there. Um, so I'm gonna spoil something later. This sucks for programmers. <laughs> Our intake is one of these powered by a motor instead of a pneumatic. And it was awful to tune. Um, we basically need to start from scratch sometime over the summer uh, cause it was just a disaster. And we tried to make it faster and it, it was tough. <laughs> I'll be quiet about the intake. We'll let, we'll let that uh, demon lie for now, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, that's a quick overview. And now how do we tune it? Um, it's laborious. It can be boring. Um, a super annoying thing is if you're adding different terms in, like most of the time we start with just a P controller. Um, if we start adding in D, that can drastically change the shape of our response. So a lot of times it feels like we're taking one step forward, two step back kind of a thing. But um, some of the questions we have to ask ourselves is like, is it okay if we overshoot? And by overshoot, I mean, if I was driving to five and I go to six and then come back, is that okay? Um, Maybe it's okay to go to five and a half, but not all the way to six. So like, if you're trying to get that ball in autonomous that's right on the wall, that's a situation where you don't have room for error. You can't really overshoot. Otherwise you're gonna crash your intake into the wall. Um, if you have an elevator and your set point is right where your uh, mechanical limit is, you don't really have an opportunity to overshoot there either. Um, but sometimes you do. Uh, a lot of times overshooting means that you get to your goal faster. So for a flywheel, who cares if I go to 1200 and then settle back down if I can get to my set point in half a second versus a second. So that's something that we have to consider. Um, can we or should we tune this faster? Uh, our one subsystem on a robot that I won't mention the name of, we had them gear it up so that it was faster, uh, but it was hard to tune that extra speed. We made it faster, but it could have been even more uh, quick. Um, so how much time do you want to invest in that? Uh, it's a tricky question. Um, for example, one thing that we did have to make faster when we were experimenting with our uh, three and a half ball autonomous, the first time we ran it, it took like 24 seconds to run. We had to shave seven seconds off our autonomous mode to make it fit. So we had to start squeezing every little drop of time out of our autonomous mode that we could. We made that robot drive like 13 feet per second, which was the fastest autonomous thing I've ever done. You could feel wind go by you. So there were some things that we had to make faster. Some things were easier. Making the chassis go faster was easier than making the intake go faster. So picking battles about how much time you should invest in it. What's the opportunity cost of making it a little bit faster versus focusing on something else on the robot? Um, how close do we have to be? Uh, ideally, we build subsystems that have a ton of compliance to them. So maybe our intake could go down to 85 degrees and still get the ball or down to 95 degrees and still be able to get it. Um, sometimes we have to be very, very precise. Two years ago, an infinite recharge, our intake was very narrow. 
So when we tried to do our multi-ball thing, we did not have a lot of room for air. So we had to be more careful when we picked up our balls autonomously and we were slower because of that. Um, and the important thing, this is the reason that timers don't necessarily work, is that your robot behaves very differently when it has a fresh battery versus a dead battery. So we need to make sure that whatever our constants we tuned are work in autonomous mode and they work in the end game. Uh, your battery can go from 13 volts down to nine volts, no problem in the course of a match. So we got to make sure that this is robust enough to work uh, in both of those situations. Um, and sometimes that comes at the cost of speed or, um, you know, precision when it's getting to a goal or whatever. Um, so it's just a very, very time consuming process. And I remember when we were tuning, the first time that we tuned the subsystem that shouldn't be named, uh, we were just sitting in the corner, Ashley and I, and the intake was just doing this for like an hour. We were just doing this, trying to trying to find gains that would make it fast and accurate. And people kept coming up to us like, are you guys OK? What are you, what are you doing over there? It's, it's a lot of just sitting and, and trying different numbers out to find the right magic mixture that satisfies whatever you decided your constraints were. Um, now we have another little interactive part. Uh, this is going to be new for next year, but um, WPI part of their documentation, they have this little thing here that you can try out uh, tuning a PID subsystem yourself. Um, so if I put the presentation in the chat earlier, I forget if Zoom persists that and you can access it, but you can click on this link and see how well you do at tuning something. Um, since we got the late start, I'll come back to this if anybody's interested. Um, I'll finish up the rest of the presentation and we can pop back to this. This is kind of fun to play with. And if you do play with this later, offline, whatever, uh, keep in mind, you're gonna do this a lot faster than we do in real life because you don't need to load up a ball. You don't need to move the robot into position to start your autonomous mode over. Uh, so if you think it's working like, oh, this isn't that hard, do, do it in real life with us one time and you'll see how long it can take. <laughs> um, plus you gotta deal with the battery voltage and all that other stuff. You can, might be able to get this tuned up pretty well, but it can, it can be a monster uh, in real life. Um, especially the single jointed arm, no fun. Um, so that, that's the basic thing. That was the hotness in FRC and in the real world for a long, long time. Um, but within the past couple of years, uh, some of the vendors and teams started doing something called trapezoidal motion profiling. And this isn't something that they invented. It's not new in control system worlds, but it was new for FRC a couple of years ago. And the general idea is we will run a position controller, but we'll make a plan ahead of time. And in the process of making that plan, we can actually control velocity instead of position. Uh, so if you know calculus, you know there's a rate, there's a relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration, and it kind of uses all that information to make a graph sort of like this. Um, so I like to give this analogy. Think about what it's like when you're in a car um, and you're driving on side streets. You're driving with block to block, stop sign between each block. How do you drive? Uh, or how does your parent drive if you don't have a license or a permit? Uh, well, you start at a full stop down here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but at the beginning, you start at a full stop. Uh, you'll accelerate for a little bit. You'll get up to the speed limit. Um, however fast you feel like accelerating that day. Once you get to the speed limit, you'll settle down. You'll just coast, coast, coast. And then once you get close to your next stop sign, you'll hit the brake and you'll decelerate. Um, now, a cool thing about motion profiles is that you can set your speed limit wherever you want, and you can set your rate of acceleration, how fast you push down on the gas pedal. So lazy Sunday, you're going to a friend's house, you might just casually step on the accelerator, cruise at the uh, speed limit, nice soft brake. Um, if you're in a rush, 
and you guys shouldn't do this if you're about to get a license. You know, maybe maybe you're like stepping on that accelerator fast, getting up to speed, always follow the speed limit still, but then like doing a hard break at the end. Um, we can change the shape of this plot depending on what we want to do. Um, or maybe it's just snowed and you need to be even more gradual with your acceleration. It can get so gradual that it's not even really a trapezoid anymore, it's a triangle. Um, but the really cool thing about this, it's much easier to tune. Velocity systems are easier to tune than position systems. Um, it's more repeatable because you have this pre-planned path sort of thing here. Um, and it's more configurable. If you're just doing a normal PID system, um, it's gonna behave differently if you're starting a foot away from your goal or 10 feet away from your goal, right? You think about your chassis, that has a ton of momentum behind it, a ton of inertia. So as you get close, um, it's gonna behave differently than as if you started close. Um, so if you can do this trapezoid thing, this is how it was easy for us to make, shave those seven seconds off our autonomous mode because we just raised the speed limit up to 13 feet per second, up from like five. Uh, and we tightened the slope of that acceleration bit there uh, to make us get up to speed faster. So it allows a lot easier time tuning all this stuff. Um, a cool thing is that uh, CTRE and REV provide this capability on their motor controllers. Uh, it's called Smart Motion and Motion Magic. I forget who does which. Um, but we can actually run all this calculation so that we don't even need to worry about it. We just say, I want to go here. I want to go this fast. I want to accelerate this fast. And it will generate the trajectory and drive it for us. Um, and WPI Lib provides a library as well if you're doing a PWM motor controller and an encoder plugged into the RoboRio. Um, so while this is easier to tune, it still takes time. And we got to figure out what we want our speed limit to be and how fast we want to hit that gas pedal. Now, uh, this is the only higher level um, thing that I'll talk about because uh, it's very important to path planning. Um, you can notice that the robot doesn't really follow the path that well. That's our simulation's fault. Uh, but the general idea here is that it does all this fancy math. Um, so when you have a tank drive, uh, you know, the two sides operate independently. That also doesn't work well with traditional PID because one side will affect the other, it will affect your heading and all this stuff. So there's this thing called the Ramsey controller based on a unicycle model that allows um, coordination between those things. So uh, we can generate a trajectory. That's these red line, red dots down below. That's how the robot's supposed to drive. We can generate a trajectory with similar to the motion profile with a max speed, a max acceleration. Um, the library they provide us with can also do a bunch of other stuff like don't whip around too fast, don't limit your centripetal acceleration, don't ever use more than 10 volts, all these sort of constraints. And it will generate a path from that. So we give it an end point here and an end point here. And then it, based on our constraints, will generate those dots in between. Those are the marks we're supposed to hit every 20 milliseconds. Um, so super important for driving trajectories. If you want uh, autonomous driving that doesn't just go straight forward and back or just turn in place, then you'll want to be using one of these trajectories. Um, and they provide us with a tool that we can like draw the dots on the field and, and generate these things. Uh, but super handy. Very Also very hard to tune. Not very hard, but pretty hard to do um, because you got two systems interacting with each other, both sides of the robot. Uh, you crank one gain up too high, you're going to overturn and then have to correct and it can get messy. Um, so let's talk about some things that are easy versus hard when you're thinking about mechanical designs. If you want to be nice to your software people and make their lives a little bit easier. So if I set these animations up right, okay, good. So shout it out or put it in the chat. Do you think this is easy or hard? I said it was my favorite before because it's easy. Super easy. easy. <laughs> True or false? It's either in or it's out. There's the transition time maybe between, but it's super easy. Um, easy. 
stopping something, stopping a motor when you get to a limit switch. So we got a digital thing and easy. when our easy, very easy. All right. Now I, I, I broke, you'll see what I did with the answer to this, but like a flywheel. So it's a velocity control system, easy or hard or medium. I'll throw a medium in here too. Depends. How, how close do you want it to be and how consistent? That's a good question, right? So the actual code for writing it is easy and the tuning is pretty easy. Now, if you want fancier features like uh, a lookup table, then you get into hard territory. Um, maybe not necessarily hard, but at the very least time consuming, very, very time consuming. Uh, despite the fact that we change our robot from a low goal shooter to a high goal shooter in two days, uh, we probably shot like 200 balls trying to get our lookup table. So it wasn't hard work, but it took a long time. Uh, and it took us monopolizing the robot for all that time. Um, an elevator. Remember, we got to deal with that gravity offset thing. I'm going to say hard because the rest were easy. I, I should have put medium as a category, but medium. Yeah, it's, it's harder than a flywheel because you have to deal with that thing. Um, but it's not too bad, um, especially since this is geared at a mechanical audience. You can do some of that counterbalancing yourself, uh, right? I've heard a good rule of thumb. Um, that the elite team say is that if you put your robot down on the side, the elevator should be able to lift itself. Uh, so in the absence of gravity, it should extend itself automatically if it's lying down on its side. Um, I was a championship one year and I went over to 148's robot and they told me to lift it with my pinky. They had, a, they had an arm that did this and I could lift it like that. Very little force was required to do it. Um, so if you help us out by counterbalancing it mechanically with surgical tubing or springs or whatever, that makes it easier, um, but harder than a flywheel. Arms, single jointed arms. Hard. Hard. <laughs> Spoiler, these are kind of going in order. So it's <laughs> the actual code to like do the PID is not bad, but it just takes forever to tune, especially if it's super heavy, like our intake was, um, fighting all that inertia is hard one direction versus the other, super annoying. All right, I can go quicker through these. Differential, I should put differential drive, turn to angle. Hard, oh, I put turning, should be tuning. If you think about the, mechanic, the mechanics of a tank drive, of a differential drive, um, there's a lot of static friction that you have to overcome when you turn, right? Those wheels are gripping into the ground. Um, but usually once you break that friction, it'll spin around like a top. Um, so this is another situation that we add an offset. Uh, how much voltage does it take to overcome that static friction? Um, so that can be hard to get right. Uh, it also depends on how well it was designed mechanically. Like if if you have a bad drop, if it shifts a lot while it's turning, um, you know, digging in the front wheel one second and not digging it in a uh, second later, it can get real messy. We did not tune ours well this year. <laughs> Our limelight aiming, it's, it's kind of wonky. It worked well enough, but that's another thing that I would like to come back to um, in some of our off season times. Uh, driving a distance, maybe I didn't put these in order. Medium tuning. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the things here I'm putting is easy because the code for it's not hard. It's just all the investment that you have to put in tuning. Um, we wrote a lot of our code super early this year, but it just took us forever to tune in once we finally got our hands on the mechanisms. <clears throat> path planning, path driving, this really should say. I'll just go through these quicker. Uh, it's hard. Like I mentioned before, all the parameters are interacting with each other. And sometimes when you speed it up, then you start overshooting a turn and it acts wonky when you're, when you're doing the curved stuff. It's hard. And then, oh, I meant to put links in for this. Subsystem interoperability. 
one of the biggest things that makes me anxious is when somebody's like, well, we have to make sure those two mechanisms don't run into each other. And they're like, we'll fix it in software. That freaks me out every time. So if you have a system that's like, I don't want to raise this until this is at least 10 degrees. And then once it is, I can move this out, but then I have to put this down so it can get in shooting position. I was just going to link basically every robot that 971's ever built and be like, that's hard and annoying to do. They seem to live by the mantra of we'll fix it in software, but that is a nightmare for me. <laughs> um, so that was that was a quick introduction to the tuning. I we could talk about that for many, many moons and go through those examples. And you can just sit down and watch your programmer do this with an arm for two hours, making it go a little bit faster and a little bit more accurate all you want. Um, but instead, we'll jump to some of the tools that are provided to us. Um, so uh, two years ago, WPI started providing the simulation tool. Um, and it allows us to test our code without uh, actually having a physical robot. Um, you can't test everything perfectly. Like, uh, it's hard to get the physics right. They provide some tooling that allows <laughs> that. Allows that. Uh, but it's still not going to be as good as your real robot. You won't be able to really get gains, um, PID gains or whatever from simulation. But you can make sure that, like, when I hit the X button on the controller, my intake goes down. You can test logic like that. You can test wiring your autonomouses together and um, putting in an autonomous mode and see if it drives the path it's supposed to, more or less. Um, I know you mechanical kids are greedy, and we don't get that robot till the very end. So this at least gives us confidence that our um, algorithms are correct. Uh, now, once we actually integrate with the robot, we do that first integration. There's a lot of things that we might have gotten wrong or misconceptions that we might have had that take some time to work through. Like, um, did the electronics team and us get our port mappings right? Or when I try to move this motor, I'm moving, I try to put the intake down and I'm moving the shooter because the port mappings are different, right? That's something that we still have to work through on a real robot. Um, is it wired the way that we expect? So we expect 12 volts to make it go up, but 12 volts is actually making it go down. It's backwards from what we expect. Uh, we have to go change our code to handle that. So there's still a lot of integration stuff that this doesn't solve, but at least I have confidence that like, when I hit the X button, the conveyor should start rolling. <clears throat> um, another tool that you probably have seen uh, is Shuffleboard. You might still be using the its older sibling um, smart dashboard, but this is a dashboard that you can run on your driver station and it can communicate values uh, from the robot to you. And you can also send things to the robot. Uh, like in this image here, um, all of those commands that we made before and we hooked up to buttons, um, uh, we can put those on the smart dashboard and send I'm looking at chat, so they're not important. Uh, <laughs> we can all those buttons, we can put them on the dashboard and run them from there. So uh, we had one on our dashboard for zeroing our uh, pivot encoder because it would, you know, however it started up, that's where it thought zero was. So we had a nice quick button that we could run a command. We never wanted to put that on a driver's joystick, right? But it was easy for us in pit debugging to hit that button and reset um, the encoder. Um, so we can do that. You can see down on the bottom there, it's showing the angle of our intake in degrees. So we can get feedback to, mostly for us when we're debugging stuff, get feedback for what the robot thinks it's doing. That's another big thing that we have to think about. Like, There's a saying that computers do exactly what you tell them to do, right? So maybe the encoder, the gear ratio is wrong and it thinks it's at 90 degrees, but really it's only at 45. Uh, having numbers displayed on a dashboard like this can help us figure out like, oh, it thinks it's correct, even though physically it's wrong. And then we can go figure out whatever our problem is. Um, this is also where you like would view a camera field, uh, Limelight George, as we called it, uh, for the drivers to look at when they're driving around. Um, and then one thing that we do, I don't think a lot of people know this technology exists, 
and it's kind of a monster to deal with. It's not fun to make one of these things, but you can make your own custom widgets for this. So uh, you can see our robot here. We made that little animation with our big heavy intake going down and our shooter hood and all that stuff. Uh, we made our own widget so that we could visualize the state of the robot and compare like what it thinks it's doing versus what it's actually doing. Um, that helped us trace down a couple of bugs because uh, we had the encoder wiring backwards, like I mentioned, was one of the things we had to work through before. So it thought it was going down when physically it was going up. This visualization helped save us a lot of time. Uh, I think I'm almost done. Somebody asked in the chat, what time does this end? We got that 15 minute late start. So I'm, I'm pretty close to the hour that I was supposed to do. Uh, we'll be wrapping up soon. Um, and it's, we got the recording. If you have to pop off now, you can watch the recording later. Um, do, do, do. Another tool that we have for this path planning stuff, um, they give us, like I mentioned before, we can just put our waypoints on the field and it will generate these paths for us. So um, here is our three and a half ball autonomous mode. We had a path that would drive to the ball. We would shoot, that's not really included in this, but then it would drive from that second ball to the terminal, if that's what it's called. They already forgot the names of everything. Get one ball, hopefully another one, and we could go back and shoot. Um, so it's super handy way to make these trajectories. It's very easy to make them. Uh, this, I believe, is tailor-made for uh, differential drives, for tank drives, but uh, a team made one called Path Planner, which works very good for swerve drives. So if you have a swerve drive, you might want to use that instead, but it's fundamentally like the same exact idea. Draw waypoints, make lines between the waypoints. Um, and the last thing, everybody on your team should know what the driver station is, how to use it, how to connect to the robot. Uh, very handy when you're in the pit. For like two regionals, only two people in the pit knew how to drive the robot back there, uh, which was less than ideal. Um, so Another confusing thing, we typically call our computers the driver station, but the driver station I'm talking about here is actually a program that you run. Um, and that allows you to plug joysticks into your computer, send that information to the robot so you can drive around. Uh, you can also put it in autonomous mode. Uh, it enables, disables the robot. Um, always handy to know if something's going haywire, you can hit your enter key and it will disable the robot. Uh, you gotta be very safe when you're testing things, especially autonomous modes. Um, and then a little known thing, I don't know how many people know this, the driver station has a thing called practice match mode or something like this. Um, and it will actually run through the sequence that would happen on a field. So uh, you start disabled, it even plays the little bell sounds. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, it will transition you from a 15 second autonomous, disable you, and then a 215 teleop. So if you're doing driver training, it's very handy to do that so you get a feel of how quick those two and a half minutes go by. Uh, <laughs> one thing that I'll say about dead time, uh, this is on the overview slide. There's a lot of times where you'll be watching us and we'll just be sitting back in our chairs waiting and you're like, when are we going to test? When are we going to test? I want to drill this into everybody's head that the robot takes like a minute or two to boot. So when you turn it on, you're like, let's go, let's go. It's going to take a while before it turns on. Um, and then if we find a bug in the code or something we want to fix and we have to deploy the code. Uh, it can take anywhere between like two minutes and 25 minutes, depending on how your computer is feeling that day. The very first, we, the computers that our team uses, uh, old, old hard disk drive, very slow. So the first time we run a deploy, it can literally take like five minutes. But then after that, it's usually like 10 seconds. So be, uh, be patient with your programmers if they're just sitting around and you're waiting to test something. Um, it takes a while. We are just as frustrated as everybody else when that's happening. Um, and I think this is my last slide. It's just a summary of how we can make our lives easier. And typically when you make software's life easier, the driver's life is easier too, right? So especially for this first one, um, we should be trying to design uh, subsystems to have as much compliance as possible. Um, and what I mean by that is have as big of a margin of error as possible. So if you have an intake that does this and you're doing it with a motor instead of a pneumatic like a sane person, uh, you know, how exact do we have to be? 
we always have to have some allowable error in our code because we're never going to get it perfect. So can I be, do I have to be a 10th of a degree off? That's going to suck for us. That's going to be really hard to tune. Can I be two degrees off? I like that leeway a lot more. Um, you know, in some of the years, like the tube years, some teams had claws like this. You had to drive and get right up on the tube in a certain way to pick up your tube. And that's very, very hard on a driver. And if you asked me to do two tubes in autonomous, that would be very, very frustrating to have to get, you know, right on top of the tube, get centered on the tube and pick it up. Um, if you had a roller claw and I could be 25 degrees off <laughs> and still be able to pick it up, even though it's all squirrely hanging on there, that's much, much better. Better for drivers, better for programmers. Um, you should kind of try to design for autonomous. Some games, it doesn't matter as much, but if you think about this year, uh, it makes a lot of sense, even if it's only for autonomous mode, to put your shooter facing one way and your intake facing the other, right? If you're trying to do a two ball autonomous, it's much easier to shoot and back up uh, and intake your second ball than it is to shoot, have to turn 180 degrees, go pick it up, have to come back and drive 180 degrees so you're ready to shoot again. Um, that's just something that you should think about, you know, those first couple of days of the season. Um, if we want to attempt a fancy autonomous mode, you got to build that into your design from day zero. Um, and in a similar vein about designing from day zero, like if you want feedback on a sensor, you got to feedback on a mechanism, you have to have a sensor on. Um, since we're in the brushless revolution, all your motors probably have encoders on them if you're using falcons or spark maxes um neos neo 550s i should say rather than the speed controller but you probably have an encoder on it but like hey we want a limelight don't wait until week six to be like where am i going to put it uh because it affects like the math that we have to do plan for that early and finally if you go through those two tutorials and you realize it takes a lot of time it does we need uninterrupted time on the robot it's easy to get in a flow when we're doing this for two hours. And if you come over and like, I wanna measure something, it can disrupt the, the momentum that we have and be tough. So I don't know how other teams operate. If you have the means to give your programmers just a complete day alone with the robot, that's wonderful. Uh, as long as you give us a working robot and we don't break it. We broke a shaft on our drive chain when we were doing our three and a half ball. We kind of had to stop our day, but... Uh, yeah, just as much uninterrupted time as possible so that we can do this tuning. Because the more tuning we can do, the less burden we have to put on the drivers doing stuff, right? If we can automate some driver tasks, the less burden they have on them, the more points they can score. If we can tune autonomous modes, that's a big boost in points, right? So don't forget about us. <laughs> uh, yeah, we didn't break the shaft, it was gonna break anyway. Uh, don't forget about us, because there's a ton of points that can be had. If you give us two more hours, that could result in many, many more points. Depends on the year, depends on your robot and all that stuff, but don't forget about us, is all that I ask. Uh, so yeah, that was my last slide. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, as a reminder, over the course of the next two weeks, we're gonna be going uh, and dive deep into actual Java uh, pro actual Java implementation, how to do these things, how to write code, how to design code, how to share code between your teammates. Um, so I believe that's the next Monday, Wednesday, Friday, two weeks in a row. Um, and I, I believe that I will be at the Sunday uh, all team thing that we do at our practice field. So feel free to come up, ask me questions. If you want me to look at anything, if you're a programmer, you want me to look at your code or talk about anything more in depth. I will gladly, gladly do it. Uh, any questions? Slash, does anybody want to stay on and try to tune one of these things? If that's it, uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you learned something. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, if anybody wants to try tuning, I'll be happy to stay on for a little bit just to see how you do. Uh, but I think we can probably stop the recording if nothing else.
And don't feel bad if you want to bail. This ended up going half an hour longer than we would have, than we planned for.